begin. Welcome to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Hey, Joe. Hi, Pam. Pam, you know, Stanford Law School is located in such an idyllic location, and it's surrounded by affluence. But today we're going to have some guests that talk about a program at Stanford that really takes place in much different parts of the world. We are, and our guests today are Eric Jensen, who's a professor of the practice of law and director of our rule of law program, and Sean Rosenberg, who's a student at both the law school and the graduate school of business. Uh, Sean served as an army officer in Afghanistan before he came to the law school. So Eric, you direct a program called the rule of law program. What does it mean to talk about the rule of law? You know, there are about as many definitions of the rule of law as there are scholars who write about it. Uh, but one definition that, that I like that I think is credible is that uh, rule of law exists where government officials and citizens are uh, bound by and abide by the law. Another definition is Hans Kelsen's uh, definition of many years ago where he said uh, rule of law is a normative system backed by the credible threat of physical force. But as I get older and as, as I travel across developing countries, the element of rule of law that I think is really important is equal treatment of people, whether they're high officials or common citizens. So that's a great short definition of rule of law, and I, thank you for stopping at three of those, though. Uh, why focus on the role of legal education in promulgating the rule of law? Because that's really what we're doing, as I understand it. Right. Well, uh, at the law school, engaging students in various projects around the, the world, I see legal education as a useful entry point for our students. Um, at the, at the higher end, we're bringing um, uh, a, a set of uh, research and writing skills uh, to um, an exercise where uh, the, the uh, um, uh, students are, are very much engaged, the Stanford students very much engaged in writing uh, uh, textbooks for countries that are very difficult. So at one end, we're trying to you know, impart some hope uh, in, the, in the countries in which we work. Uh, leadership development. Law schools are well known for uh, developing uh, uh, leaders. And we're trying to uh, develop uh, an engaging curriculum for people to develop critical thinking skills. So basically what you're talking about is creating legal education in these other countries that are emerging democracies or we hope emerging democracies that mirrors in some ways the kinds of things we've learned about legal education in the United States. Very much so. I mean, it's it's not hard to set a higher bar. Uh, um, too much legal education around the world is is marked by very boring classroom experience. Rote memorization is is the hallmark of uh, that experience. Eric, I'm going to ask you something a little bit different now. You spend your time in really far flung places. How come? I mean, you, you could be in Palo Alto. Were you one of those kids that had a lot of maps on his wall and always want to go someplace new? So I hadn't uh, left the U.S. until, um, until I was in my mid-20s. I went to the London School of Economics to do an LLM. I uh, met all sorts of people from around the, the world, became very interested in teaching in developing countries. And after uh, LSE, I went uh, to uh, Sri Lanka, landed in Sri Lanka in 1985 as a Fulbright scholar to teach in the law schools there. And my life changed then. I left international business practice to do this, uh, th this Fulbright. So it was a radical difference, but I was so amazed, I, I thought, I think I finally found what I'm supposed to do in life, trying to figure out the relationship of law and legal institutions to political, social, and economic development. Oh, so you finally found out what you're supposed to do in life, something I know you're so many to do people so, are still you're hoping looking to do that for. sometime yes. soon, right, Joe? <laughs> so, Eric, I think we're going to spend a bunch of our time today talking with you about the Afghan Legal Education Project. How did that come about? Well, in 2007, two Stanford Law students walked into my office and said they want to do something for law at the American University of Afghanistan. And I said, good luck. You know, I, I have a research agenda. I have teaching. Uh, and I, I wish you well in this. And, and they said, 
they refused to leave my office, and they said, you know, actually, if if you don't agree to work with us on this, we can't we can't push any idea forward, and you might have an idea on what we might do. So they wouldn't leave my office, so we started to talk, and uh, I had uh, written a textbook when I was in Sri Lanka back in the 1980s at the insistence of a Sri Lankan legal academic, uh, and uh, I w- became... Well, the, the title of the, the book is International Law from a Sri Lankan Perspective, ironically authored by Eric Jensen. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I became painfully aware of the paucity of good textbooks, legal textbooks across developing countries. And so I said to the two Stanford students, maybe we should try to write a textbook on introduction to the, the laws of Afghanistan. And it was a scrappy bunch. They recruited students, and uh, the first batch was six students, and we, we wrote a textbook, uh, uh, Introduction to the Laws of Afghanistan. So how did you learn enough about the law of Afghanistan to be able to do that? It's been a work in progress. And the first edition, I wouldn't say was our best edition, but the third edition is actually looking really good. We've developed systems over time for adequate peer review and engagement of, of Afghans and making sure that every chapter that the students write is critically re- reviewed by scholars in the, uh, in the area. Who uses a book like this? Yeah. The, uh, the students at American University of Afghanistan certainly do. You know, for me, it, I, I haven't been able to take students to Afghanistan for three years because the security situation is so nasty. But in the old days, when I could bring students to Afghanistan, uh, my students would go into class with me, and we'd watch teachers capable of teaching, students eager to learn, and uh, students also highlighting textbooks that my students at Stanford uh, had written. That, to me, is as close to a religious experience as I get. Well, one of the things, you know, you had said earlier when you were trying to describe what the rule of law is, is you said the rule of law is a kind of obedience to rules backed up by force. And I think if we could bring you into the conversation, Sean, your first encounters in Afghanistan were about the use of force because you went in as a as a military officer and now you're working in this program. How do, how do you think about what you're doing now relative to what you were doing then? Sure. Uh, so my first time in Afghanistan was as an infantry officer in the Army and – the places where I spent most of my time, the rule of law before we got there really didn't exist. And the rule of law when we got there uh, was something that we were really working to implement. And the way that the army implements the rule of law is not sustainable. It's not the right way it should be done. It's it's very sort of primitive. And if the army is implementing the rule of law... And, how, did, and it, how does an army implement the rule of law? Uh, so essentially when we showed up, they're, they're really... There wasn't any of the predictability of the law and people knowing that they had any rights that would be protected against them. And there were various insurgent groups there that just sort of had free reign to go to people, take things they wanted, kill people, hurt people. And we were there to essentially remove them from where we went. So this is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with our guests, Eric Jensen and Sean Rosenberg, about Stanford's Afghan legal education program and our rule of law program. Sean, when you were there as an Army officer, did you ever think you were going to come back to the country as a lawyer or a law student? No, I I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about law school when I was in Afghanistan in the Army. Um, When I realized I was going to be leaving the Army and looked at different schools, uh, the ALAP program and the rule of law program was something that really attracted me to Stanford, though, and... um, you know, I, I joined the Army and went to Afghanistan initially for, you know, sort of patriotic reasons, but it doesn't take very long uh, on the ground in Afghanistan to realize that the way that people live is, is not what they deserve. Uh, and so it's something that I, once I learned about this program and got to see what it was about, felt really passionately about and uh, something that I'd really like to, you know, help get bigger and better moving forward. Tell us what you've been doing in the program. Sure. So... I, uh, I've been working this year on a property textbook, uh, working on property law, which has been fascinating. Um, and the program starts out, we went to Sri Lanka this year uh, with the other students in ALEP and some faculty and met with faculty and students that uh, go to AUAF, learned a bit about each other and got to see each other, which was great, and learned a bit about the legal system of Afghanistan, which is very different than our system, even 
sort of the way the legal system is supposed to be in Afghanistan when it when it's working. Um, and so sort of learned a bit about each other and got to know each other and then really dug in and did a bunch of research on the different, you know, the, the different sources where people draw law from in Afghanistan and have been trying to put together something comprehensive that, uh, you know, people can read and understand and really learn about what rights they have. Can you tell us about some of those sources? Where, where does law come from in Afghanistan? There are a lot. <laughs> I, I'm, I think, yeah. Eric, you're going yeah. to jump in on this yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, Afghanistan is the land of legal pluralism. So there is customary law. There is Islamic law. There is uh, uh, secular law that is influenced both by uh, civil law tradition uh, and, since uh, the Taliban fell, uh, common law tradition. So – uh, trying to work with students, and this is a dynamic exercise both for the, the uh, Stanford Law students and for the students in Afghanistan, navigating through this land of legal pluralism with overlapping layers of uh, authority and jurisdiction. Yes, so one of the things that is, I wonder how much what you're doing is trying to describe the law as it is and how much of it is trying to move the law to where you think it ought to be. It's both. There is, there is a descriptive element to the law, and sometimes even the descriptive element isn't so easy to ascertain. Uh, when uh, students of mine were writing a textbook on obligations uh, several years back – You they, might want to – Explain to Obligations our, yeah. is, uh, is like uh, contracts and torts put together. Let's just uh, call it contracts. Um, when they were writing a textbook on contracts, the civil code is the primary source of law. And they discovered that there was no good translation of the civil code into English. So they were lost. So fortunately in our project, we have resources. We uh, paid to have the civil code translated, uh, good translation into, uh, into English. It did make me worry, however, that uh, there was so much rule of law advice going on in the country for 10 years before we actually translated the civil code into a reasonable uh, translation into English really worried me about what rule of law promoters were doing before then without a good translation into English. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with Eric Jensen and Sean Rosenberg about the Stanford Rule of Law program and its work in Afghanistan. You know, this reminds me of, as an academic, of studies other academics have done of small, usually cohesive groups like Jewish diamond merchants, for example, and what they've done in absence of using commercial courts. And this seems like this issue magnified a million fold because now you're seeing what a whole large pluralistic society is doing and you don't speak the language. Is I, I'm guessing. Is that right? I do not. You know, yeah, there's, there's a yeah. pause here because I'm looking at Eric and Sean and it's the best we can do. I think. Is, is that you, a reply? You know, actually, yeah. we have a uh, law faculty at yeah. American University of Afghanistan, four full-time uh, faculty, all of whom are Afghan. So we've got serious local content yeah. and local navigators. I mean, when I go to Afghanistan, the last time I was in Afghanistan, I met with the new chief justice, and I was pleased to meet him because he's the best chief justice since the Taliban fell. I met with the uh, new attorney general, who is the first attorney general that's, that's good uh, since the Taliban fell. And uh, so, I mean, I have, I have access, and those actors speak English, but uh, no, I don't speak uh, Dari. Or yeah, Pashto, but, but we the, do. But we do translate our textbooks yeah. into Dari and Pashto. So one of the things that's interesting is I wonder whether you know. It, it, sometimes people say, "Well, can law students do this?" But I wonder whether, in some sense, you don't have shown a sort of comparative advantage in writing textbooks for other law students because you're so much closer to knowing how do law students think and how mm. how do law students learn. I mean. Has that been part of your experience translating almost sort of what you've learned in law school as well as dealing with the substantive law of Afghanistan? Yes. I mean it's it's been a great exercise, especially coming from legal education here at Stanford, which is fantastic. But wondering sort of if I was to learn this 
tomorrow in a class how would I want it to how would I want it to look how would I best understand it well that is happening in other courses and, and it is it has been very helpful and it's been a very it's been a great exercise for me and I think something I can take forward practicing law in America because so much of this is writing these I don't speak Dari, but we're writing a textbook in English for people that speak English as a second language. And so things need to be pretty readily understandable, which is something that hasn't an always art. come across for, in some of my in some of my legal yeah. textbooks. No, it's an art for to write law in a way that's comprehensible to smart people who aren't particularly sophisticated in law. It's a real art, and you're gonna be really glad you've done that when you have to try and draft contracts, write to your clients and the like as well. Absolutely. So I want to bring up a, a general issue that I bet a lot of our listeners are thinking about, which is kind of what's going on in Afghanistan. I mean, it seems from a distance pretty depressing, really. And you're cl so much closer to it in a key way. Do you sometimes think this isn't worth doing, or maybe the U.S. just oughtn't to be there? So thank you for the question, Jill, because that's the elephant in the room, is, you know, this has been a long, long uh, war. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to those in the American public who say we should, we should just leave. Um, but I have, a, I guess, a, a positive answer and a negative answer. The positive answer is there are a group of Afghans who are really trying to imagine a different future for their country. And many of those students are, are law students at American University of Afghanistan. But it's a generational thing. There are a lot of young Afghans who uh, feel held down and under the thumb of uh, warlords and, and others in the, in, in the system and are unable to unleash their, uh, their abilities. So uh, you know, at, at the micro level, we're trying to provide some hope for this, this group, uh, this cadre of, of leaders for, for the next uh, uh, generation. But on, on the negative side, uh, ungoverned spaces in this region of the world are really unkind. I was in Afghanistan in April of 2017, right after the mother of all bombs had been dropped on Nangahar province and the border between Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. And I had dinner with the deputy head of intelligence on that meeting, uh, on that trip. And uh, he said, Eric, you know, we've only cleared two of the three caves that were revealed by the bomb. But in those two caves, there were 11 nationalities. So, International terrorism has become a, a highly profitable migratory business, and ungoverned spaces in that region uh, will attract uh, bad eggs. We'll be back with more from Eric Jensen and Sean Rosenberg about the rule of law program, Afghanistan, and Stanford's work on legal education there next on Stanford Legal on Sirius XM Insight 121.